little bubble wrap I had in there. So this is Hey y'all, I am just working on picking a few things to get ready to list online. And then somebody had also asked me about selling on Facebook Marketplace. Kind of just what my thoughts were on selling through Facebook Marketplace. And I've kind of got, uh, I don't know, mixed thoughts on that. So uh, I figured I'd show you these few things. We run through them and talk about Facebook. Something I think a lot of you guys will recognize right off the bat. It's pretty common. Uh, I believe this one is Indiana Glass Company. I think it says on there. Yeah. Indiana Glass. And it doesn't say anything on here about the design or, or color or anything like that. But I believe this was called their honeycomb pattern. And olive green, I think is what they called it. It's green, nonetheless. But uh, these kind of came about what, in the late 60s, 70s, something like that. And, you know, the, the color certainly suits the time period anyhow. And they were they were popular. You know, they're a cool-looking dish, and they are got that honeycomb uh, pattern on them and everything. They're pressed glass. They're highly, you know, mass-produced and everything. However, I don't... I don't typically always see them like still in package, still in original wrapper and stuff. And so I just, I thought that was really neat. I had seen this at the thrift store a while back. And again, you know, I don't, I don't pay a lot for items, guys. I just, I, I typically don't. It's got to be something like really exceptional <laughs> for me to uh, come up out of pocket, you know, more than a few dollars for something, because the truth in reselling is you can look up comps all day long. It, that's never a guarantee that that's what you're going to get for it. And so sometimes unless you've sold it before or something similar and you kind of have experience in it and, and a feel for mm, sort of how to market it well, you know, when you list it and that kind of stuff, I, sometimes it can just be the ups and downs with it. Sometimes you'll make a little more money on a piece that you maybe didn't expect to and sometimes less and it can be kind of difficult to uh especially on something like this when it, you know it was mass produced if nothing else if you can't remember the the pattern uh name or or you know the exact year it was produced and you know all that kind of stuff not even who made it necessarily even if you can't remember all that you can at least look at it and recognize that it's a mass produced pressed piece of glass that is pretty it is decorative they were very popular people still collect it today and so you know you, but you know that you're going to kind of hit sort of a ceiling most likely for most pieces anyway of you know, on average, maybe that $30, I would say, is kind of the cap on, on most pressed glass pieces. And, and typically, you're going to be sitting anywhere like $12 to $18, sometimes less, sometimes more, but generally kind of right in that spot. And that's that's about where each one of these independently sell at, or anywhere from, you know, really about $8, $8 to $15 a piece, just depending. But again, I don't typically see them still in their original package, you know? So I think that adds a little bit to it. Uh, how much? I don't know. <laughs> I still wouldn't think I'd get probably more than 35 at most, maybe $40 for it still new in box as new old stock. But generally you'll find these dishes all the time in the thrift stores and, and stuff like that antique stores and again they're cool dishes they're they're cool looking they don't glow to my knowledge they don't glow but you know they have a good uh they have a sort of design to them with that honeycomb pattern that i just don't know that really goes out of style and you can decorate it up in different ways and you know they've got a good use for them i will say too on on mass produced pressed glass pieces uh like somebody had mentioned the EO Brody vases, those green vases that I showed, I don't know, a video or two ago. And uh, I didn't mention in there that they're, you know, floors pieces, but they, they are. And EO Brody, they didn't even actually produce the glass themselves. 
but they were kind of more that third party. They, they were more the distributor of it. So they would have their designs and pieces made by, I think most, for the most part, it was Indiana Glass, if I recall right. It's been a while since I've looked it up, but they did like a lot of, of companies. Um, you know, Indiana Glass produced glass for a, a wide array from, you know, small distributors to large ones and stuff. And so EO Brody is another one, though, that you'll find constantly. They did a ton of milk glass. They did a ton of the green glass. They did some also clear and brown, I think, both. And then they had a little bit of fancier stuff they kind of dipped into. And they would order, I think it was crystal pieces from like Turkey. And it would say, you know, like made in Turkey for EO Brody. It would have like a sticker on it or something. But nonetheless, still mass produced. I think there's a reason though that these pieces, not only were they mass produced, but they still survive today, is for the most part, a lot of these pieces are like utilitarian style they are they're built with a little bit of oomph you know <laughs> they can they can kind of take around a little bit more of a beating than like depression glass or elegant you know depression glass and porcelain and, and all those kinds of things so far more fragile things and not that you can't chip and break these you'll find them that way all the time but they just can take a little bit more of a punch a little bit more of wear and so Although today, a lot of these pieces being mass produced and you can find them fairly easily and so they don't carry a great value, I, I really feel like pieces like the EO Brody uh, vases and stuff like that, eventually, I think they will have a, a chance anyway of increasing in value as time goes on because the mindset on a lot of the mass produced pieces currently are like they're they're kind of worthless because they were mass produced and so they kind of get you know kicked out the door to the side they're not as important they're not taken care of as well they're not as maybe collected as others and so we'll we'll wind up eventually seeing the numbers available on them decline over time and eventually they will be a little more scarce uh you know and it may take a while for that but it but it will happen you know a lot of the glass and stuff that we find that was you know 1700s 1800s and is valuable today a lot of that was mass produced maybe not quite on the same scale as something like this but but nonetheless mass produced and it wasn't necessarily good quality you know meant to stay with you the rest of your life things these weren't necessarily even prized possessions always but just the fact that they have survived to today makes them incredibly valuable now so just something to keep in mind when you're looking at stuff like this is like pick it up if you get it cheap enough you know if you're getting it for a couple dollars especially new old stock I mean come on you, you can't go it's worth more than a couple dollars we know that right but uh you know if, if you can get it for the right price grab it is it going to make you rich? Probably not. No. I mean, let's just be let's be honest about it. It's probably not. But that being said, it will always find a home. These are not terribly difficult things if they're in good condition to to sell. And the reason is is because they're cool. They look cool. They're decorative. They they can uh, you know, uh, withstand moving from house to house occasionally and stuff. You know, they can just that's why they're still here. So, anyways, I just thought I'd throw that out there when it comes to mass-produced things because I feel like we're kind of, and me too, you know, they're they're the less they're the less important glass pieces out there. But I think it's important to remember, you know, even Fenton did floral wear pieces. So, just because that's what it was intended for doesn't mean we should necessarily just kick it completely out. I think a lot of those pieces eventually will will come back around and you know, they'll be they'll be harder to find at that time because they weren't looked at as any sort of prized possession now. So, just I don't know, something to keep in mind. Uh so this one here is a unofficial throw out to George the Antique Nomad who would do a far better job explaining to you anything about this piece than I ever really probably could but I believe this was done in the 80s uh maybe late 80s or so the, this kind of comes in different patterns but they look similar so they have this one um towels or towel 
I'm not sure how you say that, towels. But they have another one called, called Sombrero, I think. And it has like a Sombrero bowl in it and stuff. But this was another thrift store find that I had gotten. And, you know, old, new old stock. Let me pull it out of the box here, though. Oh, no, they are separate, the bowl and stuff. Come out of there with it, man. Oh, buddy, please, no critters. All right. Woo! It's heavy, I'll tell you that. It's It's got some weight to it. So... This is, husband came home. <laughs> uh, so this here is the bowl and try to get it where the light will let you see it. Uh, it's pretty, pretty basic, pretty simple uh, design. It's definitely got that 80s feel to it. You know, that Southwest 80s uh, vibe going on. And that there is the back of it. Uh, made in USA. So it is, it is heavy. It is weighted, guys. It is weighted. Uh, so this part here obviously has more of the decoration on it with these chili peppers, but it has the same border, matching border as the bowl. Uh, but anyways, this just sits in the little center there. Whew. It's heavy. I'm a little worn out now. Uh, sits in the center there, you know, put your dip in there. It's a cool, it's a cool piece. I, I kind of like it. I'm not personally, like, I like certain Southwest decor pieces. I'm not huge in, like, the pastel pink. I'm not, I'm not a huge pastel color person. And so, you know, for me, it's not one that I would look at and be like, oh, wow, I've, I've got to have that. But there's a lot of people out there that do incredible jobs decorating with Southwest stuff that I don't know that I could ever pull off, but they somehow do. And somebody out there could easily incorporate this into their, their not just decor, but as a usable piece, you know, for parties and stuff. Uh, you know, it's a good heavy ceramic it would withstand a lot of hands going around it and stuff, you know. So it's it's a it's a good piece. Sad to say, uh, you know, when I'm looking up comps on them, there's really not a lot of exciting actual comps. Now there's a lot of listings out there, and I want to say those were anywhere people were asking between fifty and a hundred dollars for them. But comp wise, like what has actually sold has been usually that $30 to $50 range, I think, at best. And so uh, not all of those have their, you know, original box and all that stuff. Um, I mean, this one even still has the original, like, heavy cardboard insert that, well, it goes like that. This piece sits down in to hold it in place, which is cool. That's awesome. Like, that makes me feel far more comfortable shipping wise that it, it'll arrive safe but uh yeah surprisingly the, the the prices on it just aren't aren't that that high and I don't know if it's just maybe there's not as many collectors or or uh, people using like the southwest decor style right now but I don't know you look at other southwest decor pieces and they sell pretty darn well so I don't know the rhyme or reason uh, I think treasure craft in general tends to be pretty good quality uh, especially utilitarian wear pieces like this and so, uh, you know, good quality and, and will last last a while, especially in environments where you've got, you know, high traffic or kids or, you know, things that can be a little more destructive potentially to, to your more fragile stuff, your fine china and things. Uh, so, I mean, I really liked it. I got it in the thrift store. I don't know. It might have been $5 or so, maybe at most. So, I mean, I knew, I'd, I knew it was worth more than $5. Uh, it's new old stock in the original box. It's worth more than $5, but in all honesty, not a whole lot more. And in my experience, uh, while I've seen a little bit of an uptick in Treasure Craft, kind of overall resale values on, on Treasure Craft, whether it's, you know, figurines or pieces like these or whatever, there seems to have been a little bit of an uptick in, in sales on it, but, uh, or, or value on it. 
but overall it kind of carries a, a, like a median to to low range sad to say because i really i personally do like treasure craft i think it was from what i can tell in my experience with the pieces and holding them and all that stuff they tend to be in pretty pretty good quality so i think it's another one of those almost sleeper things sort of like the florist wear you know heavy duty glass pieces and stuff i think that as time goes on and we'll see these pieces kind of slowly disappear you won't find them as, as often you know in the thrift stores and stuff because eventually you know once they go to the thrift stores if they're never bought up never made put into somebody's collection again or used by anybody again they eventually wind up at the dump you know so uh, over time as these non-important pieces or seemingly so pieces uh continue to get pushed out the door you know in the trash you know or or broken and, and all those kinds of things i think it'll, they'll become more scarce and i think that they'll with time become more valuable so i i wouldn't suggest stocking up all your inventory on these specific kind of items necessarily but these are the kind of items you will find when you are buying things in bulk when you're buying things at like estate auction you know lots and stuff and so it's still good to know because a lot of a lot of things you're going to come across are going to be more in this category just kind of that that median to low sort of average sale price and those are fine those are absolutely fine nothing wrong with them if you're getting it at the right price get them because like for instance me paying five dollars for this well i was pretty sure i could probably sell it for 20 at least right so there's still always money to be made don't turn them away but uh I think that I think that pieces like this are are the sleepers right now, and so over time they they will pick up value. So if this is your decor style, and you collect you know treasure craft or you collect Southwest or whatever, I think pieces like this are are good to get and hang on to them for a little bit. If that's your if that's your collection, don't buy them and hang on to them as a reseller, but as a collector, you know get them now while they're while they're cheap, while they're plentiful. Why not? Yowza. Okay. So that piece weighs just under around eight pounds in total in the box. Just about eight pounds. So that will be, and because of the size of it, that's probably, I don't know, a 12 or 13 inch box. Maybe 13 by 13 inch box. So that's going to be a decent sized box. It's going to be a pretty weighted box. So that will be a little pricier shipping wise, but uh, I think I'm going to just, I'm going to get it listed on eBay and that way it's got plenty of, ideally anyway, theoretically, plenty of eyes uh, on it and everything. Same thing with that Indiana glass piece. You know, they're so common and stuff, but I think getting it exposed to as many views, uh, potential customers as possible is is key for it and finding it a good home but it will be one that is more expensive to ship and so as always beat this horse to death but you know it's always something to take into consideration when you're picking up inventory and when you're buying things in lots through through like estate auctions and stuff sometimes that's kind of out of your hands you know it's it's something that's coming along with a piece that you are intending to get or or whatever but that doesn't mean you need to throw it out or or not you know try to make a profit on it or at least you know profit a little bit from it might as well uh this next one here kind of still has this auction sticker on there i might leave that on there at this point i don't know i'll maybe take my heat gun to it and go over it a little bit and see if i can pull that off without removing all this not that the box is in great shape or anything <laughs> certainly wouldn't want to damage this but uh but it's still it's not that bad i mean it's not pretty but it's you can still read it and all that you know this model 220 f195 was 1964 through 73 is when they made these and let me set it on the floor here to pull it up so when I got this, the estate it was in uh, was sort of in a rural area. And so this was actually kept like out in their, 
It wasn't a barn, but it was like a big uh, garage shed, but like one of the old school ones, you know, it ha had more of a barn feel to it. I, I wound up having to take the shop back to the box and everything <laughs> because it had all those like weird alien looking spider guys in there and they were, I believe all dead, you know, but they were like hanging out on the cardboard. It was just, ugh, it was so horrible. Uh, but I, I was able to get it kind of cleaned up a little bit and he, for the most part, really didn't, you know, this piece itself didn't need a whole lot of cleaning up. The box was a little more scary. Uh, but I mean, he looks like he's in really good condition. I mean, obviously he was used a little bit. Uh, although these little, see them little white, uh, like mesh cloth kind of things in there those are the little pieces that that hang from this and like light up and they really didn't even look from what I can tell anyway really burned or anything they just I don't know maybe they got dry and fell off maybe they were slightly used and then got dry and fell off but whoo it's kind of heavy uh one thing you'll notice on here is uh, Pyrex and this might be upside down since that's written upside down but made in USA for Coleman so I think that's interesting this is kind of a thin glass and I like the look of it it kind of has that slight wavy appearance to it like like old school glass um, and by that I mean like much older than the 1960s I mean like the old wavy window panel glass you know but all the knobs on it seem to be overall in in good condition from what i can tell Ooh, let's let this guy down boy that's a workout i'm gonna tell you so here's my conundrum with this guy is there's still kerosene in him and i can't i can't figure out how to get it out like this doesn't really come off that almost seems like a vent or something over here this like just green metal thing there we go and then this part is like is this a primer I don't know like I don't even know how you would fill this thing I would think it would fill through this part but I don't know it doesn't seem to like it comes to a stopping point and I'm scared I'll lock it up if I push it any further. So I don't know how to get the kerosene out of here. <laughs> that is my issue. That's why it's not listed yet is because it's, it's still, it, it's got the fluid and you can't ship it with that in it. So if anybody out there knows how to carefully open this up uh, to get it out, I would I would greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm sure there's probably a YouTube video or something that I could watch on it, but I have yet to take the time to do that. I would I just wouldn't think this would be this difficult, <laughs> but apparently it is. So, so I'll tell you guys. I was looking at the comps and stuff for it for recent comps, and uh, I'll put some comps up here for it uh, too, but I want to say for ones like this in this condition, you know, range around 130 to maybe 150 or $60, I think. Uh, I was noticing though that there's a ton, not a ton, but there are several listed on uh, eBay and other platforms. And I mean, I was seeing them in over a thousand dollars as asking price. And I could maybe see somebody asking a couple hundred, maybe, given that they sell in that 130 to 160 range. Maybe. But I think it would probably be a little bit of a stretch. I think it's really cool. I think, you know, like this one's in excellent condition. There's there's very minimal, like, age wear to the green enamel. And, and it just looks like it was hardly ever really used. And it almost looks like it was maybe turned on once just to see wh what it does and then turned back off and never never touched again. I don't know. It just doesn't look like it's, it's seen much wear. 
you know, it's, it, the box is pretty beat up, but it technically still has the box and it's still like, you know, the print on it and everything on the outside is readable. So I think that adds a little bit, you know, to it, but I still wouldn't expect really more than at best $200, but I would, I would probably anticipate closer to that, you know, 130, 150 region. To me, that feels like more, probably an appropriate number for, for what it is uh, you know, and all, all the things about it, the model and all, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Coleman's a, a well-known brand name. We all still, you know, pretty well know that name. And, uh, you know, again, they didn't, they just don't make them like they used to. And I think that's what adds a little bit of the value to pieces like that. Uh, especially when you can still find them in good usable condition is because a lot of pieces back in the day, they were just, they were made to last and people do not produce things now with that goal in mind so you know that that is in lies where you know that is where the value lies in these kinds of pieces and so I think it's I think it's really cool uh, but I, I don't think I don't think asking over a thousand dollars for it is probably a realistic number to try to obtain I, I'll never tell anybody not to go for it I mean give it a try but I think I think when you're pricing things like that, you you one you have to be grounded. Be and look at things like, what would I think of paying for that? Not just what, you know, even comps are for, but sometimes you have to ask yourself like, mm, what do you think the actual realistic value is of it? If you wouldn't think of paying that number, why would you be asking somebody else to? So. These are often referred to as a sugar firkin. Uh, this one, as you can tell, is decorated. It's got the little wood pegs that hold the handle on. It, it smells like it's older, but I don't know that it's, it's terribly old. It, it may be, you know, early-ish 20th century, going into mid-century maybe. Uh, you know, it's it's definitely done in the style of an antique antique firkin. Uh, they typically would have a matching lid with some kind of a like finial knob on the top to lift it up by. Uh, you can see it's got uh, this type of sort of I can't remember what they call this, but it's kind of like a belt strap band that's stapled on here, and then it's all hand decorated, hand painted with these birds. I'm not sure exactly what bird they are. I want to say maybe some kind of parrot. I'm not positive. There's two more on the back. It's very uh, primitive, rustic. Uh, you know, the artwork on it's kind of that naivety folk art sort of thing. It's it's very cute. It would look great, you know, with somebody's rustic primitive decor style. But I just, I don't know that it's as old as some of these actually can be, which the older ones are, are of course, always gonna be your more valuable ones, can, assuming they're in decent enough condition. So I was looking in my kitchen antiques, 1790 to 1940s. So you can see on here, there's a sugar bucket, uh, circa mid 1800s, all original, staved, butternut, good mustard, yellow paints, carved wood handle, pin to the sides, button knob on lid, so you can kind of see that example, like what I was talking about, and uh, let's see, smithy forged nails hold the bent wood wrapping, so uh, on this one, there's no nails or anything that I can tell holding this together, it's literally just banded, and then this bottom piece, there's kind of a, a ridge cut, in the bottom where this piece sits into. So that's that's all that's holding these pieces together. It, they probably have to some degree a little bit of wood glue or something in there. Uh, but then here's another example of one. I don't know if you guys can see, but it has those same similar like banded pieces on it. Same thing down here. Uh, this one is more like a, a snake tongue divided instead of just being one strap it's like this piece right here is is more shaped into the like snake tongue I don't know how else to really describe it <laughs> uh, 
but this one here is circa 1800s. It's pine. If I had to guess, maybe pine is what this is. I haven't fully really investigated into that, but if any of you guys know, just looking at it, you could definitely let me know. Uh, it looks like maybe it was band sawed on, you know, on the bottom. So I'm not sure that kind of tells me, uh, you know, a power tool. So we're not looking at anything too terribly old just based on that. Uh, but this one says circa 1800s, pine, staved oak, copper tacks, hold, lapped over bent wood bands. Stain suggests there may have been a third band above the one at the bottom. Cause so it's missing one. Uh, it's got a carved handle, underside of lid is impressed with F Lane and Son uh, Marble, Mar Marlboro Depot. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. So uh, sometimes you will find these where they'll be marked with the store that they came from or, you know, the manufacturer of who actually made the piece. A lot of times these pieces you'll find were handmade just at home and stuff. These were things people frequently used in their home. Uh, so here's one that's circa 1860. It's staved wood with peg fastened carved handle and bands marked Wilder and Son, South Bingham, Massachusetts. So, and these are all, uh, I think smallest is like nine inch diameter by about 10 and a half inches high. And this one here is like 14 by, what's it say? 14 inches tall, 14 and a half total diameter on it. So you know, they're all generally uh, right about this size, but so when I look at things like this and I'm thinking, okay, it's, it's looking antique. It's got all, you know, these little hallmarks of, you know, all these little hallmarks of being truly antique. And yet at the same time, if this was actually being used with any sort of frequency by somebody, whether it was to hold sugar or whatnot, I would still expect there to be more wear on this decor, this paint up here on the handle. And I don't, I just don't see that, you know, I mean, it's slightly worn, but not like somebody who's holding this handle. So this wasn't taken to pick berries with or anything like this. This just tells me it feels a little more, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily made to be used for the purpose it looks like it would have been. It makes me think it's more, not tourist piece, but a decorative piece that maybe would have been produced at some point. Uh, so, you know, there's a little trickery to it though, because it does, it does kind of have that like old antique wood smell to it, like the old sort of like lacquer or stain or whatever they would put on here. Uh, there's these primitive suggestions with these like wood knobs, it, it, you know, it looks all hand done, but I'm not convinced. I'm, I'm not convinced this is 1800s. It could be, but again, I just, I would expect a little more use wear on it if that was the case. So I don't know if any of you guys have any ideas on, you know, roughly where it would have been made. It's kind of got that Pennsylvania Dutch sort of, uh, primitive folk art style to it. Uh, so I don't know if the Northeast somewhere, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I got it in a state auction here in the Midwest. So I don't know for Facebook marketplace. Somebody had asked me to kind of just comment my thoughts on that. And, you know, I went through again last night and stuff and I was looking through it to remind myself like why why I hadn't pursued selling on Facebook in an online platform manner anyway, uh, more than I currently do. And so I had gone in and opened like a business, uh, Facebook account. It's attached to my primary Facebook account. And on there, I'm able to, like when I list things on eBay, I'm able to share that listing on my Facebook, uh, business page. However, I have not at least been able to find where I can go into marketplace and, and add things in marketplace in the same sense as when you're doing it from your personal page. So I have a lot of stuff listed on Facebook marketplace, but it's done through my personal Facebook page because on my business page, there is no option for that. You have to set up a shop. And so when you set up a shop, if you go and you start reading, you know, in Facebook and everything, it's set up through Shopify. It's so it's now you're pulling in a third party. Okay. And 
I'm not super familiar with Shopify. I, I don't, uh, I don't know that I've really heard a lot of things kind of either way about it. I feel like I've, I've probably heard a little bit more kind of, I don't know, iffy things or that make me uh, weary of, of doing it. And some of that just may be my own paranoia of, you know, venturing out onto too many of these platforms. I, I've heard horror stories about different ones and, you know, I, I don't want to sit and, and dog any certain platform. So, but I'm sure that we've all heard them. You know, it's not, it's not a grand mystery. I think it would be fairly easy to kind of go figure out which ones kind of seem a little more iffy or not. But, uh, so there's that part of it there, like to set up where you can actually sell online, uh, as a business on your business page, that just seems kind of difficult, complicated, and I'm not excited about how many different parties are involved here. So you have that part. And then to do online sale transactions, uh, with shipping and stuff on, on Facebook, it just, it gets kind of sticky in my opinion. And I'm just, I'm maybe not well versed enough to, to grasp it all. So it may be, it may be totally easy and fine to do. I, I, I just personally haven't found it to be that way. Uh, there's things that make me hesitant about it. Like when you're reading about, uh, how you're paid out, uh, when you're selling on, on there, it's, how is it? I have it written down. Okay. So to receive payments from sales sold with shipping, you'll need to link your PayPal or bank account is what it first says. Funds become available in your PayPal account four days after delivery is confirmed. To receive payments from Facebook, from Facebook itself, so uh, this would be things like, uh, it says chargebacks, buyer coupon payments, reimbursement from appeals. To receive payments on, on these kinds of things, you can only link your bank account. That's it. You can't have your PayPal for that. Facebook can only Facebook can only direct payment directly to your account for these things with your bank account, not your PayPal. Uh, your funds become available three to five business days after that. Should you have like a, a reimbursement from appeal or, or something like that. It takes essentially another week before your funds would be available. I find that just odd in today's quick transaction, you know, like we normally think of like, that's just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, your PayPal account can't receive payments at all from Facebook itself. You can only issue refunds through marketplace, not your PayPal account. So see, it just starts getting real complicated. And I, then I find the information starts conflicting a little bit. So on another page talking about sold with shipping, your payout is initiated 15 days after you mark the item as shipped or five days after the item is confirmed delivered. And I find that a little odd. I find, I, I don't like that fact. Uh, once payout is initiated, it may take another five days to reach your account. In total, it may take 20 days from the time you mark it shipped. Then if you sell an item uh, and ship it, online through Facebook, they also impose a 5% fee uh, based on the total item price, shipping cost, and sales tax. There's no fee for like your regular local pickup, you know, meetups, what you think of normally when you do uh, Facebook marketplace, you know, buying and selling. But when you start getting into the uh, e-commerce end of it, it, it starts getting complicated and I just, I find the information seems a little bit conflicting for me and it makes me hesitant, uh, to, to mess with it. If I'm going to be just completely honest about it. Um, then there's other things too. So like when I went into marketplace for, you know, going through and looking at my items and stuff, uh, which again is through my personal Facebook page because you don't have access to just go on marketplace and sell from a business page. You have to set up a shop if you're going to do that. So for my personal page, I have things listed and 
I, I remember here not long ago, Facebook was sending me notifications wanting me to boost my post for $29. And it was like a $6 item that I have listed on Marketplace. So they want me to basically pay them $30 to do what for a $6 item that I have listed as local pickup only. I just, that is, that is insanity to me that it's not even basing like a percentage off the sale, like a, you know, 1% or 2% or 5%, whatever off the sale itself of the, you know, for the item but it's wanting me to pay $30 to boost a post on a $6 item that I have listed. And I, I find that to be a little bit quirky. So it's things like that that make me hesitant to sell online through Facebook. I'm not against doing it otherwise, but those kinds of things, I don't know. And I, th I would strongly encourage to go and listen to other people that do sell on Facebook marketplace that, that have more experience on it than I do, because these are the things that have stopped me from actually trying it. And maybe, maybe things work out great. Maybe things are, are wonderful selling on Facebook marketplace. I can't vouch for that either way. Uh, so I'm not even going to attempt to, because I, I don't know. Um, but these are the reasons that I personally have held back from doing it. Um, but yeah, I do suggest going and listening to other people that, that are and see what they have to say. Uh, listen to them talk about how, you know, they set up their accounts and, you know, hoops they had to jump through the process of it and all that kind of stuff and, and kind of feel it out. And anytime you take on a new venture selling platform, whatever, there's always going to be things that are, you, you don't understand. You have to figure out. You, sometimes you just you don't really get it until you've actually just done it. And, and that's to be expected. And I think, there's always going to be a little anxiety with doing that, but you know, you have to kind of take that leap and, and just go for it. Uh, but I, I also think it's important to read the fine print a little bit and understand a little bit of what's going on. I have had, um, people, uh, contact me that like out of state <laughs> for some of the things I have listed on, uh, my Facebook marketplace and ask me if I would be willing to ship it. And I've always just explained to people, this has happened, I don't know, two or three times. I've just explained to them that, you know, I, I only sell locally through marketplace and, you know, but I have a eBay store and I'll send them the link to my store so they can see that I'm not just some crazy person, you know, <laughs> trying to scam them or something, but, uh, I'll send them a link to my store and I'll say, you know, I'm happy to list it on eBay for you. And, you know, at whatever price is already agreed to and stuff, just we're moving it over there. And then that way, you know, the shipping end of it, fees and all that jazz is, is already handled. The, um, I've, I've done several sales, lots and lots of sales now through eBay and, you know, hold, hold your breath, but I have yet to have, have any, uh, real issues with it. So uh, with my experience selling through eBay, I feel far more comfortable so far. That being said, I know that there's probably horror stories out there. There probably are for, again, any platform you'll go to. So you can't just hear one thing and like write everything off. And that's not my intention, uh, you know, by, by giving this information. These are just the observations I've personally made and what give me hesitancy. Not that I would never be open to maybe doing it, but these are the things that I, I don't understand well enough and they make me hesitant to do it. So uh, I, I suppose that's kind of about all that I, I have on that. Uh, but I encourage anybody that sees this video that, that sells on Marketplace, you know, please drop some comments and stuff down there and, and give some input, whether it's good or bad or indifferent or, or, you know, whatever, because, uh, I think it'd be good to hear from people that, that actually do sell online through Facebook and, and hear your guys' experiences too, because again, I haven't, I haven't actually done it myself. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask experience wise, uh, and it'd be useful to get, you know, a lot of different opinions and ideas and thoughts on it and everything. So, um, but yeah, I guess that's it for now, guys. Uh, as far as this bucket, I don't, I don't know what to price him at. Uh, this is one that I was going to kind of toss out to you guys also and give me some ideas. What are your thoughts on it? You know, uh, I, I feel like it's probably 
at, at best an early, you know, 20, 20th century piece, or I, I kind of feel like I'm probably looking at more close to mid century with it though, for, for some reason. Uh, and I'm just not sure, you know, I don't want to list it as antique if I can't really definitively say with a certain amount of confidence and certainty that it is in fact antique. And I don't know. So what are your guys' thoughts on it? Um, the other things I'll, I'm going to get listed, you know, basically like we talked about, but, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your guys' opinions on this. So, uh, I guess that's it for now and I'll see you guys on the next one.